Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Inheritance Conference. I'm Dietrich Neumann. I'm the director of the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage. And apart from welcoming you and saying that we're all very excited that this moment has arrived at the uh, conference, I wanted to thank Marisa Brown, our director of programming, who put this uh, wonderful event uh, together and really began in 2019 with a student initiative that focused on our Joubert wallpaper uh, from 1835. And uh, Marisa then won a big grant from the Terra Foundation to organize a conference on how communities respond to controversial artwork. And the result, as you all know from your program, is this uh, a wonderful event with 24 speakers, performances, exhibition, uh, and uh, accompanying uh, events. And of course, one such response to a, a controversial artwork is the installation in our hallway of Jasmine Lee Johnson's um, incredibly beautiful series of screen prints on fabric, which you see a part of it you saw on the cover of the uh, conference uh, program. And the opening is tonight for those of you who are nearby. We'll put many images online, of course, tonight at 6.30. And it's just one of many uh, events that come in the context of this uh, conference. So um, very exciting to be here at this moment. And we greatly look forward to the next uh, three days. And I wanted to thank you all for participating as speakers, as uh, uh, discussion leaders, and of course, in the audience. And on this note, I would like to hand it over to Marisa Brown. Thank you, Dietrich, and welcome, everyone. Um, so as Dietrich said, this is the first day of the Inheritance Conference. We had a kickoff event last night, but for the next two days, we'll be on Zoom together. Um, the Inheritance series looks at how communities are responding to controversial, problematic, and often deeply racist artwork, um, as well as monuments or heritage sites in public places. But before we begin, I think it's important to address the issue of land, occupation, and restitution. As the university, as Brown University works to establish an official land acknowledgement with our colleagues at the Native American and Indig Indigenous Studies Initiative, one that recognizes the Narragansett Indian tribe, its history and stewardship of these lands, and I hope that creates meaningful action today we should really be clear about the ways that this center has benefited from displacement, settler colonialism, and slavery, because there is no center without these things. What we do today about this history is a question we must all answer to ourselves and to those ancestors who came before us. So today we come together to hear testimonies from a truly amazing group of people who, for many different reasons, have devoted years and sometimes decades to work that bridges activism, community organizing, historical research, artistic practice, and the realities of colonial legacies, as one speaker puts it today, as well as white supremacy. Across today and tomorrow, the speakers who will present are all multi-hyphenated. They are elected officials, attorneys, tribal leaders, educators, curators, historians, heritage workers, and artists. Some are paid to do the work that they will share and many are not. They do this work in service to their communities. They are zooming in from across the country from Detroit, DC, Houston, Richmond, New York, Columbus, Missouri, DeKalb County, Georgia, and Bemidji, Minnesota. And outside of the US from Manchester and Swindon in the UK, and Victoria, British Columbia. Many of them will share firsthand accounts of initiatives and actions that resulted in the removal, reinterpretation, or recontextualization of um, public and commemorative artworks, heritage sites, and museum collections, while others are gonna present on efforts to protect and preserve sites that have been ignored or under-resourced. We're in the midst of a reckoning as communities seek to reshape how and whose history is told and commemorated in public space. This may entail radical changes to the art that hangs on our walls, the monuments in our public squares, 
and the stories that are told at historic sites as the public landscape that we have inherited continues to evolve as it always has. We know how critical public and commemorative art heritage sites and museums are to defining national, racial, gender, and other identities, and how such stories about the past continue to shape power relations in the present. So while we today and tomorrow may be looking at slides of historic artwork, we know that we are dealing with very live issues of power and privilege, erasure and caricature, and we're dealing with them today. It can be easy to think that we stand outside of history and are looking back on unfortunate representations from the past when we come face to face with art or with heritage stories that participate in systemic racism but we are not outside of this history. What we choose to do changes the course of the future. This is the work that the speakers and the moderators are doing, and I wanna thank all of them for taking time away from this work to share it with us. I'm guessing that many of you who have come today are here because you're involved with similar efforts in your own communities, or you're considering such efforts, or maybe you will become involved after this conference is over. Inheritance is designed to be an action-oriented event series. So there will be time at the end of each day for audience members to join together in small groups on Zoom and discuss some of the issues the presentations raise, to share the work they're doing in their own communities, or maybe make connections that result in collaborative projects or actions. If you registered for this, you've been receiving my email reminders with the many Zoom links in one place. So please do note that there's a different Zoom link for each day of these breakout sessions today and tomorrow, um, and that there is a passcode to join, but all of that information should be in the emails. Before we begin with session one, um, I'd like to mention two institutions that provided necessary support for this. The Terra Foundation for American Art in Chicago and the Brown Arts Initiative. This was, as Dietrich said, originally planned to take place in 2020, then the pandemic hit. But I'm really thankful that we're finally here together to have this conversation. It would not have also have happened without two of my colleagues at the Center for Public Humanities, Sabina Griffin and Ron Potvin, the six Brown-based moderators who are with us today and tomorrow, and the three public humanities graduate students who you will see doing speaker introductions and guiding breakout room conversations. Tracy Picard, Sophia Ellis, and Julia Zimring. So with that, a few notes about Zoom. Please feel free to submit any questions or comments as they occur to you in the Q&A box, which you can open by clicking that icon at the bottom of your screen. Each session's moderators have access to that box, and they will draw from it when they moderate panel conversations at the end of each session. If you're having a technical problem, you can put that into the chat box and it will come to the panelists and the technical support team. Other than that, enjoy the day, come back tomorrow. And um, if you're in the Providence area, join us tonight at 6.30 PM at the Center for Public Humanities as we celebrate the opening of Jasmine Lee Johnson's Not Nevermore, an installation in our ground floor hallway that responds to our department's own problematic artwork, a historic wallpaper titled Views of North America. Um, so why don't we look at the session one intro slide that will give you a rundown on um, the session to come. Session one is titled The Burdens of Inheritance. Speakers from this panel will share about public history or public art projects they have been involved with, with a special emphasis on the personal and community stakes of this work, why it's important for them and why it's important for the communities they work with or are part of. The first set of speakers that I have the huge pleasure of introducing, Denise and Paul Puglio, are the Sagamo and Sagamo Squaw of the Kawasak Band of the Penacook and Abenaki people. Paul is an indigenous historian, lecturer, and a founding member of the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs, where Denise currently serves as vice chair. And in Denise's spare time, she creates coil, bark, or woven baskets, and produces traditional ceremonial clothing. Together, they serve as federal religious advisors, affiliate faculty members of the UNH Native American and Indigenous Studies minor, 
and our founding members of the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective. They will be our first speakers of the morning. Jennifer Scott, our second speaker, is Senior Vice President of Exhibitions and Programs at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit, one of the nation's most significant Black history institutions. Prior to this appointment, she served for a year as co-chair of the new Chicago Monuments Project Advisory Committee. Appointed in 2020 by Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, she helped to convene the commission to rethink the city's monuments and public memorials and to create new public engagement opportunities and public art commissions. Before her civic work with the city of Chicago, Jennifer was director and chief curator of Jane Addams Hall House Museum, a historic landmark in Chicago that focuses on civil rights and human rights issues. Our third speaker, Sadia Habib, joins us from Manchester in the UK, where she is the, the Our Shared Cultural Heritage Coordinator at Manchester Museum, where her work revolves around making the museum a better place for young people to explore identities and become active and vocal participants in organizational decision making. She has radically changed Manchester Museum by setting up a young collective of culturally diverse young people who are embedded in the museum and regularly lead on activities, campaigns, and events that reflect their communities and identities. And finally, our moderator, Mary Kim Arnold, a beloved Providence-based writer, artist, and teacher. She is the author of The Fish and the Dove, a book of poetry published in 2020, and Litany for the Long Moment, a work of literary nonfiction published in 2018. Mary Kim teaches in the nonfiction writing program at Brown University. Denise and Paul, welcome. Kwai Nido Bak, in Delawisin Denise Pulio Sagamo Swa. Wood Delawisin Paul Pulio Sagamo Kawasak Band of the Pinnacle Gabnaki people. Kiona Ayan Odena Kunipi. Hello, friends. My name is Denise Pulio, head female speaker, and this is Paul Pulio, head male speaker and chief of the Kawasak Band of the Pinnacle Gabnaki people. We are speaking from our headquarters located at our ancient Pinnacle village of Odena Kunipi which translates to the village at the narrowing of the waters on Lake Winnipesaukee, which is now known as Alton, New Hampshire. Due to the number of projects we are currently working on, we'll be moving through this presentation very quickly. If you would like any additional information, please don't hesitate to reach out. Next slide. We begin our presentation with a land acknowledgement statement. Nandakina, our homelands, is the unceded traditional Ancestral lands and waterways of the Pequic, Abnaki, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the Aki, the land, the Nibi, water, the Awan, air, Olakwizakak, the flora, and Awasak, the fauna, that our ancestors are Elmabak, the original human beings who have stewarded Nandakina through the generations for over 12,000 years. Next slide, please. We begin sharing briefly about who we are and how we inherited the history that we have today. We are a pre-constitutional tribe that is not state or federally recognized. The state of New Hampshire does not have a state recognition process. We have officially petitioned with the federal government back in the 1990s for acknowledgement. What you are looking at on this slide is the boundaries of our homelands. As you can see, it encompasses most of Northern New England. Next slide, please. There are eight paradigms that have shaped the historical marginalization of the indigenous population. Disease, we were vulnerable to Western diseases as a result, lost a large majority of our population. Religion and ethics, the 1493 papal bull inter catera issued by Pope Alexander VI, which allowed for the lands and assets of any non-Christian to be confiscated. And if they re refused to convert, were killed or sold into slavery. These same papal bulls are used today to uphold the U.S. Constitution. In 1823, the U.S. Supreme Court cited that these papal bulls justified the pattern of domination, oppression, and genocide of indigenous peoples across this nation. Technology, the access to European guns and gunpowder and metals, put us at a disadvantage in, in the conflicts. Colonial land use and settlement, confiscation of indigenous lands and gardens and colonial dam construction, further diminished our populations. We're unable to grow our crops due to loss 
loss of land in the colonial dams prevented the fish migrations which further starved indigenous populations. Trade and commerce, we have heard stories of unfair trade. It should be noted that the Jesuits commented on our honesty and ethics were beyond reproach and surpassed our own, and yet colonials traded very unfairly with us. Warfare and conflicts, with no other options left like countless other populations trying to oppose a dictatorship, we, it led to fighting and protection of our lands. Colonial legal suppression, colonial governments actually outlawed our religion, our dancing, our singing, and even gathering together in the, 19, in the 1630s. Until we gained the freedom of religion in 1978, an indigenous person could be hung or sold into slavery in the city of Boston until it was recently uh, revoked in 2005. Also false historical narratives, early colonists were singularly focused on acquiring our land. And we found through research that much of what is considered historical fact is actually colonial misinterpretations, manipulations, and propaganda to ensure the retention of illicit gains. Next slide, please. This is one of a series of paintings that were created in the 1950s inside the Durham, New Hampshire post office. There has been a long debate about this piece of art and its caption that reads, cruel adversary, adversity. Many, many want the picture removed, citing its violent negative depiction of an indigenous person burning down a colonial garrison. But, it, but is that what you are really seeing or is that what your brain is telling you to see? What are you really looking at? The picture is quite simple. It's of an indigenous man behind a bush looking at a garrison holding a torch. It's nighttime, so it's not unusual to have a torch. Remember, that is a colonial era flashlight. And is the house on fire? Or is that your brain completing the story based on the historical education that you received? Is it the use of the caption, cruel adversity, that depicts the warring thoughts? And what if I told you that the Jesuits had quoted Abenaki, referring to the colonials as cru cruel adversaries? If you were one that saw violence, you're not alone, and, you're not, and you are part of the majority. Though through the use of manipulated or even blatantly false history and propaganda in our educational system, indigenous people continue to struggle in society today. In order to move forward as a unified nation, we need to have a unified past. And we can only achieve that through the correction and inclusion of the true history surrounding the foundation of this nation. Next slide. To help correct these inaccuracies, natives, uh, narratives, we worked with several professors at the University of New Hampshire to develop INHCC, the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, a collaboration of community members seeking to uplift the Indigenous voice and begin decolonializing New Hampshire history. We initially started with a single project and student in the fall of 2016 and have expanded to over 30 different silos of study, which also include developing educational curriculum, videos, interactive added resources we make available free to educators and to the general public. Next slide. As we expand INHCC, we also expanded our work with the University of New Hampshire. In just two short years, we were able to establish the Native American Indigenous Studies minor in 2019. Since that time, we have been expanding the Indigenous presence, knowledge, and use of language throughout the campus in fun, sustainable, and educational ways. Next slide. This is a slide that shows the uh, UNH Land, Water, and Life Acknowledgement Statement. You can read that. This is one of the first issues we addressed uh, was developing a land acknowledgement statement with uh, UNH. And uh, it addresses the foundation of the school to help refocus the university's principles towards proper and land stewardship and inclusive education. Next slide. This is a CAPE project. Since, we, since then, we continue to work with professors to establish different courses that included partnering with indigenous peoples and help merge Western and indigenous sciences and knowledge. With the CAPE project, indigenous partnerships were established with the Sami in Sweden and Inuit in Alaska to study climate change. We are losing the ability to grow and gather our own traditional foods and crops. So this is an important project. We're hoping to stu this study will help us determine what our future may hold so that we can begin to adapt and modify agriculture, agricultural and cultural practices to preserve them for future generations. Next slide, please. 
We also included a, a, a marine coastal uh, marine project that focuses on building relationships with local indigenous people and marine researchers and activists. Our waterway restoration projects directly affect our aquatic family members and hope that together we can help restore and rebuild the fish and shellfish populations that were decimated by colonial dams and infrastructure. Next slide, please. As we dig deeper into local history and archeological research, it was becoming more evident how false colonial narratives stripped away everything held dear by indigenous peoples. The Great Bay Archeological Dig is one of those sites that will change the history of the region. By using Western and indigenous sciences, we have found evidence showing centuries of occupation, including friendly relationships and dealings with the colonial tenants. The archeological evidence show how these relationships saved the colonial family. While the Abenaki burned down the town in an act of retribution for the kidnapping and enslavement of 300 of our ancestors. We are still looking for our extended family today. Next slide. This brings us to the historically manipulative Oyster River Massacre's state historical marker. This marker speaks to the Abenaki burning down the town, but completely excluded the information about the kidnapping and selling into slavery of 300 Penacook. Next slide. This is the Baker River marker. It celebrates the slaughter and scalping of an entire indigenous village. In spite of the fact that the river already had an original name, Asquama Chamamak, which translates to a salmon spawning place. Next slide, please. This is Audion Point. This is a marker that will be updated with a great example of how to develop inclusive history. We received funding to develop a 3D application to be released next year showing virtual depictions of historical uh, indigenous life and landscapes and how we use this location of Odeon State Park and two other locations, including Strawberry Bank Museum and the Star Island off the coast of New Hampshire. Next slide, please. This is probably the most controversial inclusive history project we're working on. This is the Hannah Dustin Monument erected in 1874 and is the first statue ever erected to a woman in the United States. The story of Hannah was made famous through the writings and preaching of Cotton Mather. What's not mentioned is that it included two men, two women, and six children. The statue was erected to spur manifest destiny and the forced removal of tribes from their lands. Many want the statue torn down. However, that does not erase all of Mather's books or the books based on Mather's tale. Site destruction would also eliminate the only place we can permanently correct this manipulated narrative. We are currently working on establishing a new expanded park that began with the purchase of land to develop a rail trail into downtown Concord and also includes acquiring additional state and town lands. The site goal includes correcting the false narrative by telling the full and shocking true story of this tragic event which is nothing like the version we have all heard. Next slide. This is a uh, newspaper comic that was published by the union leader in 2017 in Manchester. It's about our work trying to preserve the Wares Beach Drive-In uh, Theater, which was also listed in national historic places as a village and burial ground for our people. If this was a colonial site and graveyard, its preservation would be ensured. However, those same rules don't apply to indigenous graveyards in the state of New Hampshire. So we have to seek public assistance to raise the funding to purchase back what should have never been taken or bothered with in the first place. Over $4 million is the asking price for this piece of land. Next slide, please. We're also working on narratives about uh, place names. A recent mandate, which was enacted by the Department of the Interior to remove the use of certain words such as squaw, for geographical features throughout the nation. The term squaw was originally taken from our Algonquin language. It is not a word on its own, but actually a suffix added to uh, make a word gender appropriate. The colonists took this suffix and turned it into a slur. We're working with the state of New Hampshire to develop an inclusive geographical place name. In this situation, we kept close to our original uh, honoring of our grandmothers with the word nokamik ik, which in which means our grandmother's uh, cove, or Allah 
Ba'akak, which was chosen following a cultural norm, which describes it as a physical location, meaning it is good, smooth water. Next slide, please. As we work to restore our waterways, we developed a documentary with corresponding educational resources to help with the removal of colonial dams. We discuss indigenous land stewardship and that we all have a choice. We can do better than the paradigm that we have inherited. Next slide. After the release of Swimming Upstream, we persisted in community environmental education. As a result, the town voted to remove the Mill Pond Dam. This moment of environmental justice will change the future of our waterways and hopefully ensure the survival of many fish and shellfish populations for future generations. Next slide. This is just a quick slide showing that it can be done. After the removal of the Exeter Dam, the fish migrations began almost immediately. This year, May 14th, we'll be celebrating the return of the Ale Wife Festival to Exeter. Next slide. Mascot use is an enduring problem in New Hampshire. We have been successful in changing some institutions. However, we are unsuccessful in passing statewide legislation this year. And in fact, this is the second time we've tried to ban the use of human mascots in the state. The bill was defeated, citing freedom of speech, despite having created a ban on critical race theory, preventing discrimination in the public schools. And this was done by law. Next slide, please. We also try to continually uh, pass legislation and fail to correct the false narrative of the Columbus landing here in the United States. Through grassroots efforts, we have begun changing towns and cities on an individual basis. We hope this change sweeps across the nation and that New Hampshire will accept the true history of the foundation of these lands. Next slide, please. What can you do? We hope as you leave here today, that each of you considers what is happening in your local community and how you can help change the narrative and uplift Indigenous voices to be more inclusive and, and develop a healthier place for all beings. Oleoni, we thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Denise and Paul, for all the incredible work that you're doing in the public sphere to address false narratives. Um, there's definitely some resonances in the work that I will share also. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I wanna thank Marisa Brown and Hannah and the entire Brown University Public Humanities team for inviting me to speak um, in this incredible, important conference. I'm humbled and honored to be in conversation with so many incredible minds and practitioners, including our esteemed moderator and my fellow panelists. Um, I, I am now based in uh, present day Detroit. So I first wanna acknowledge that we are situated on the contemporary and ancestral lands, homelands of three Anishinaabe nations of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi nations. Next slide, please. So we've been watching and participating in a national, I would say even global movement that marks an acceleration of calling symbols of white supremacy into question. Um, at least since 2015 with the Charleston church massacre at Emmanuel AME Church, following which in an act of civil disobedience, Bree Newsom famously pulled down the Confederate flag from the South Carolina State House. And shortly thereafter, the demand to remove Confederate symbols accelerated and reverberated across the country um, and across the world. Uh, and these efforts have been going on for decades and decades. So it's really interesting to see the acceleration happen. Now that so many racist colonial and sexist monuments are being are coming down and there's a grass movement to uh, call for them to come down, questions emerge, what if anything should replace them and what critical conversations should we be having around these sites in re-envisioning how we memorialize histories and um, are there op opportunities for healing and reconciliation? So I'm going to talk about the um, work that we were doing in Chicago for the past two years. Um, in 2020, three Christopher Columbus statues were taken down by the city of Chicago uh, that summer after massive public pro protest and activism became 
a public safety issue. There were many clashes with the police and activists where a number of people were hurt. And of course, people were protesting uh, Columbus statues being so visible uh, and, and, and with no accountability for this history and of genocide and exploitation of native peoples in the Americas. And um, mind you, many of these statues, the Columbus statues um, and many more that were called into question came directly out of the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago that intended to create these artworks to glorify the discovery, the exploration, the expansion of America and to promote a specific idea of progress and, and victory and civilization uh, that is now being questioned. And it's set in Chicago, it's set the norm of uh, public artworks and memorials for at least the next 50 years. Next slide, please. In response, the city formed a new memorials and monuments initiative to assess the city's public memorials, monuments, and public arts collections with a goal to identify monuments that may be inconsistent or problematic with our current values and to make recommendations for these and new works, I was asked to be one of the three co-chairs of the citywide commission. Uh, and we were very aware that the committee was part of a nationwide conversation reckoning with these antagonistic, uh, larger than life, singular, false, incomplete historical narratives uh, represented through our monuments and other public works. Next slide, please. So we had a number of charges and the first one was to create a committee and we formed, I think one of the most diverse committees I've ever worked with, brilliant uh, a community of artists and activists, cultural and civic leaders, elected officials, historians, preservationists, who were all wanting to come together to figure this out and very invested in having this conversation for what was the first time citywide. Um, we, also needed to, it was clear that the city needed to catalog their collections, which is often the case in many cities. They don't even know necessarily what they have in their collections, whether they're on exhibition or not. And we wanted to look at the existing collection to make recommendations about what should happen, but also to keep our eyes on the future about how to build better collections and to do that collectively, that we're more inclusive and uh, reflected the values that we care about. Um, and an essential part of the entire project uh, was a lengthy, lengthy public engagement process that we felt was incredibly necessary to do this well. Next slide. So this, the city out of 500 monumental sculptures and commemorative plaques that were in the public way in, the, in Chicago's parks and boulevards, 41 were flagged for discussion, and this was quite confusing to people, which I think reveals a lot of things because people immediately thought that we were flagging the monuments to tear them down. And we were actually flagging them for discussion first, because first of all, we have no idea, we've never had this conversation before, we had no idea how people felt about these, what they thought about these. And so it was interesting trying to convey that we really do wanna hear what people have to say about them. And that was the main point that no decision had been made about what to do about the monu monuments yet. But it also kind of shows how little people are probably asked to truly publicly engage in these conversations. Next slide. So why the, these were flagged and particularly uh, the criteria we used were uh, summarized here, promoting narratives of white supremacy. Of course, all these things needed to be defined, presenting inaccurate or demeaning characterizations of indigenous communities and American Indians, uh, memorializing individuals with connections to racist acts, such as slavery and genocide, presenting selective oversimplified one-sided views of history, and of course, not including sufficiently other people in stories besides white men. Uh, which I, I think uh, uh, when they did the uh, final assessment occupied 97% of the, the city's art collections uh, with only 3% women. Uh, so in particular, women, people of color, and also themes around um, important parts of history, labor, migration, community building. The outcomes of this process um, were to address critical challenges with the art collection and, and monuments and memorials 
but also to release what we hoped would be a multi-dimensional report uh, that um, gives a lot of context and recontextualization to these collections and makes recommendations about them and the future and offers uh, new tools and educational public resources. So education was a big part of this, also trying to create or figure out a methodology or mechanism for the ongoing selection and evaluation of artworks into the future for generations. So very big charges. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you some examples of what the flagged objects looked like. So some of them were on exhibit and some of them weren't. This was actually the Kinsey Mansion plaque that was removed during renovations, I think in 2018, but it was in a very public space. And you can see from the um, text on the plaque, there a number of these uh, were uh, uh, language that, had, that glorified whiteness and non-nativeness. So the first white child that is in, in this area. Next slide, please. There were a number of other objects that, um, this is Jacques Marquette, Louis uh, Joliet Memorial of 1926, that depicted uh, pioneers and explorers and founders of the city uh, who were portrayed as he heroes. And essentially the, the history, the larger colonial legacy that had devastating and tragic effects for Native Americans of the region was completely invisible. And instead you had uh, depictions of, you have depictions of Native Americans in subservient positions uh, as you see here in a second role or uh, um, in uh, very demeaning. Next slide. Uh, if Native Americans weren't depicted in demeaning um, subservient, um, portrayals, you also would see these sort of idealized, extreme warrior stereotypical images of Native Americans, as you see here in the Bowman and the Spearman. Next slide, please. This uh, is a bust of Melville Fuller. Um, this is another example of, of tributes and, and statues that were created to heroicize individuals who were civil war generals and presidents and founding fathers, which represented a number of the uh, statues that were also flagged. And he was the attorney and legislator who pres presided over the Plessy versus Ferguson case that sanctioned separate but equal law and essentially facilitated segregation. And so this was flagged because here we were in Chicago, one of the most segregated cities in the country. And you know, asking the question, does it make sense to have a tribute to a pro-segregationist? Next slide, please. Uh, and I mentioned founding fathers. Um, there were several flagged of Abraham Lincoln and here George Washington. Um, where again, the, it's the, the statesman side of their history that is portrayed and not the fact that he uh, enslaved hundreds and hundreds of people. Next slide. So we had guiding principles that we created uh, with the committee and part of the guiding principles insisted that we wanted the, 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 the community engagement to be a central part of this process and that it would enrich the process and it should reflect the demographics of, of, of the city. And we wanted as many people to be involved. We created all sorts of um, opportunities, different types of engagement, some that were broader, some that were more intimate. This is all happening during COVID and the pandemic. As so you can imagine um, the challenge of doing these on Zoom was also um, um, interesting because we didn't want there to be alienation. So we did, we had direct website feedback. We had community stakeholder meetings with specific groups that were closed. Uh, we had a uh, larger kind of national speaker series on, on various topics that were educational. We had what was called drop-in sessions for more intimate conversations. We put out two major calls. One was for community hosted partnership programs. And another was for um, uh, uh, artists or communities to reimagine um, monuments. Next slide, please. So uh, we created a brand new website where we uh, 
listed all of the objects that were all the statues that were flagged and we invited direct feedback and we received direct feedback. Uh, next slide. Well, it's not the next slide. Uh, we received over 2000 direct responses. They were, some were longer than others. Some included research. We also included uh, many, many uh, well-researched letters and emails. Uh, it was clear that uh, there's a lot of passion around the statues. Some people had responses that were just, just take it down or keep it up or protect or some, some were more involved. So it all varied, but it was probably one of the more democratic um, engagements. Next slide, please. The drop-in conversations, we wanted to also create uh, more intimate opportunities. So we did weekly conversations online where people could sign up and we capped at 25. And our advisory members would uh, volunteer to lead these discussions and people could come with any questions or comments about anything on this topic. And we learned so much through all of these important conversations. Next slide. We had over 1,700 people participating in over 40 public meetings and presentations. We had eight different community stakeholder meetings, 2,000 website responses, and all of this um, data and qualitative um, responses are being um, crunched and, and put together and analyzed, and there will be a report uh, that still hasn't been released, but will be soon. Next slide. We also, as I said, put out a call for community partner programs and um, we solicited, there wasn't a lot of criteria, we provided funding. So each group had $1,500 to host something and we gave all the support that we could infrastructurally to make that happen. It was an incredibly diverse set of programs. Next slide. Um, I think that we had, um, I think it was it was over 20. It might have been close to 30 that we had in a little time, three, three and a half months or so. Um, and it really showed us what was on people's minds in terms of um, who they wanted to memorialize, which statues and mem memorials they felt the strongest about. Next slide, please. Okay. So all of this work, at work the question kept coming up, looking towards the future, what is possible? What can we think about in terms of rethinking how we memorialize history and how we create artworks and how we create um, monuments into the future? Next slide, please. So we put out another call that we call a uh, request for ideas, reimagining monuments. And we did a workshop, an orientation workshop, so people wouldn't be intimidated to invite people in. It was for artists, but also anybody, community members, anybody who had an idea. It didn't matter how developed it was. It could be very nascent, just something that you wanted to propose. It did not have to be fully developed, and it could be fully developed. We got so many interesting submissions. And the idea was to look at these submissions and see if uh, the city could further invest in some monuments, uh, new monuments um, or interventions or corrections. Next slide, please. So one of our advisory members, uh, Romy Crawford has just come out with a book called Imagining Alternative uh, Monuments and very aligned with, with our projects um, questioning of um, what a monument can be. Does it have to be very large in scale? Does it have to be made of bronze? Can it be a, a minor history? Uh, can it be made <clears throat> with the intention for it to disappear or be revised at some time? If so, how will it look? Can it be portable? Can it be mobile? You know, um, uh, does it need public sanction? Could it be a story? Could it be a narrative? Could it be a performance? All the ways that we could reimagine collectively how to memorialize history. Next slide, please. Uh, so some of the examples of, of proposals that came in here are, um, uh, this is actually uh, reflects an effort that had been going on for quite some time, many decades. Uh, a number of community organizations had been advocating for a proper monument to honor Jean-Baptiste Dussault, who's of Haitian descent. He's the first permanent non-Indigenous settler of Chicago and uh, hardly has been uh, spoken about or known about in Chicago's history and also his wife, Kitihawa was a Potawatomi woman. And um, there's all sorts of new initiatives that are being proposed to further their, their legacy for the first time. 
Uh, next slide, please. There is an effort um, building on this book, Chicanas of 8th, 18th Street in an area of Chicago called Pilsen. There's a proposal by artists and community groups in this neighborhood to mark the story and events that in this book that have shaped Latina and Latinx women's experiences, especially the very untold stories of the activism of women, uh, Chicana women, which has not been told. Next slide, please. The Chicago Torture Justice Memorial is a project that was designed by Chicago artist Patricia Nguyen and architectural designer John Lee. It's called Breath, Form, and Freedom. And it's a permanent public memorial that will honor the resiliency of survivors who were tortured under police detective John Burge, um, almost uh, 125 Black and Latinx men. The monument will commemorate a struggle for justice and reparations from the torture survivors and will serve as a site for continued healing and building. The next slide, please. The Chicago Race Riot of 1919 Commemoration Project proposed a series of artistic markers to commemorate the 38 people who were killed in 1919, a story that's also not uh, well known, uh, but defined Chicago in many ways during what is still noted as one of the worst incidents of racial violence in the city history and in Chicago. Um, and the project hopes to memorialize it to move again towards justice, equity, and healing. Next slide, please. The Visibility Project is a proposal from A Long Walk Home, a really important um, organization, arts organization that empowers young people to um, uh, uh, against violence against girls and women. It has committed to activating public spaces with division, um, public spaces and, and hopes of black girls and young women. Uh, and it is, um, it's an ongoing project that creates an altar as an ongoing traveling community monument to missing and murdered black girls. Next slide, please. This is uh, actually already mounted. This is the Coil Serpent by a wonderful artist uh, known as Santiago X, Native American artist. He was also on our advisory committee. Um, he goes by X, I believe. It's a monument that was created in 2021 on Indigenous Peoples Day um, as a celebration of the connection between the peoples and waterways of the Chicago land area. Next slide, please. So there's lots of takeaways. The report is certainly one of them, but I, I think some of the, the interesting uh, points that came up through this process is that people really wanted even more deep engagement with the city's existing art collection. They were interested in making interventions and contextualizing it and re-examining the history. They wanted to, there's a huge enthusiasm, which is really nice to see, to support non-traditional ways to approach memorials and monuments. Um, there was a lot of discussion about um, getting out of this traditional idea of dedicating a monument to an individual or a single person and, and look at collective monuments or causes and create them together. Uh, people really wanted to continue to establish public processes for re-examining public monuments and artwork, so they really liked this process that we had sort of fired up. Uh, and they wanted to see further investment, of course, in inclusive narratives and unsung stories and um, pri prioritizing youth programs. Next slide. So there was a lot of discussion also about taking down monuments, which I'm sure all of you have heard and the erasure of history. And I just, I wanna share this quote, which I think aligns with the project's um, feelings about it in general. And I'll just read part of it. A monument is not history itself. A monument commemorates an aspect of history, representing a moment in the past when a public or private decision defined who would be honored in a community's public spaces. To remove such monuments is neither to change history or erase it, but changes with such removals is what American communities decide is worthy of civic honor. And so we have quite a wonderful charge and responsibility to figure that out together. Next slide. Thank you all very much. I hope we have time for um, discussion and questions at the end. And you can also reach me here at this email. Um, and we, um, I look forward to our next speaker.
Um, thank you so much to Paul, Denise and Jennifer for sharing with us their really important and necessary work um, trying to rep repair historical damage and striving for social justice. Such a privilege to hear the three of you speak and really hard footsteps for me to follow now. Um, however, my presentation does neatly follow Jennifer's on statues and monuments in our cities. I'm going to present to you a project that I led on in the UK to create a space where young people, creatives and academics came together to explore some of the very questions that um, Jennifer mentioned. Um, so they collectively thought through this very knotty issue um, of how to respond to or dismantle these sites that tell very significant stories about our past. So in 2020, I worked with colleagues as a researcher in the sociology department at the University of Manchester, specifically in the Centre for the Dynamics of Ethnicity, which we call CODE. And we were studying the changing shape of cultural activism, with the main focus being exploring perspectives on the processes of contesting and removing statues that memorialise histories of slavery and colonialism. And the research team compared statues cross nationally and in places such as the UK, South Africa, the US, Martinique and Belgium. So some of you will be really familiar with that iconic image and iconic moment of the pulling down of the statue of Edward Colston in June 2020 by Black Lives Matter activists in Bristol, UK. And this was an act of solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and a remarkable turning point in cultural activism and protest in the UK. One year since Colston fell, he re-emerged in a new space in a museum. And the infamous figure of Colston and his role in the trade of enslaved people is well known globally. Um, and there was passionate debate and discussion. We heard a lot from politicians, media commentators um, throughout the UK who were ardently sharing their perspectives on what had happened in that moment. And wearing my hat, slide two, please. Sorry, next slide, Hannah, thank you. Yeah, so wearing my hat as the Young People's Coordinator at Manchester Museum on a project entitled Our Shared Cultural Heritage, I was really keen to research young people's stories about statues in their towns and cities. And I spoke to members of my young collective at the museum and I saw that they were longing for safe spaces to critically reflect upon these figures memorialized in stone in the spaces that they call home. Young people's voices remained generally unheard or marginalized in the heated debates about statues. And yet they had been at the forefront of the cultural activism and the Black Lives Matter protests throughout the UK. So I put a call out for young people interested in taking part in the research. Um, and we call the project Who Statues, Whose Stories. Um, this is a poster that was designed actually by one of the audience members today, Hawa. Um, so I put a call out and in the first session, when people joined, they, the young people brought pictures and images um, and stories about the statues that dominated their towns and cities. Next slide, please. They presented their own perspectives on place identities on these statues, as well as on the kind of mainstream dominant narratives about these historical figures they'd learned, they had been learning over the years in schools and colleges. Um, and they talked about how their, their historical knowledge was um, very Eurocentric because of the education curriculum system in the UK. Um, and these are some of the statues that they chose themselves to discuss in detail. And then the following week in another session, researchers from CODE, um, Dr. Megan Tinsley, Dr. Chloe Peacock, Dr. Ruth ramsden Karelsi, and Professor Gary Young were invited to share their research in the wider project we were working on about statues in a global context and a more historical perspective. Um, and then later, we had another session where two talented wordsmiths, Sahema Manzur Khan and Manira Pilgrim, came and impressed the young people with their creative writing advice and inspiration. And then finally, the young people 
uh, went away and wrote some really stunning poems. I'll share some, <clears throat> I'll share one of them shortly um, and perform their poems for us. Next slide, please. So these are some of the key questions that emerged in these sessions. These were the questions that mattered to the people collectively exploring and, and thinking more deeply about how we might respond to these problematic representations of race in public art and architecture. Um, the questions highlight the complexity of the debate, the debate which is too often simplified or polarized in media and political discourses. And after these sessions, the young people again highlighted that they needed this space because even though there'd been so much media coverage after Colston was taken down, there were no formal spaces for young people to reflect upon the contested nature of statues of empire and colonialism. Next slide. So when young people have spaces to reflect over and collectively discuss those aforementioned questions about public heritage and also think about their lived experiences as racialized citizens, we see the thoughtful responses that emerge, responses that situate the young people at the heart of the debate and that draw upon how racism is heavily embedded in the popular narratives about statues. Lest we forget, one of the, po one of the young members of the museum collective wrote, lest we forget you say, but you have already forgotten the black and brown bodies who were so benevolently beholden to empire massacre and conscripts of cannon fodder. Next slide, please. These are some of the other titles of the poems that the young people wrote. Next slide, please. So the young collective, they shared their thoughts on the questions um, and they discussed what was happening in their towns and cities. They engaged in this uh, collective reflection with one another. They took part, they took that discussion back to their formal education spaces, to their universities, and they raised these conversations in academic lectures and seminars. They wrote about their learning in university assignments and dissertations. They wrote blog articles, speeches, poetry, and these beautiful photos here are taken by one of the young collective members, Samir, um, and these are two of uh, two very brilliant young people, Amin and Sameha, performing their poems last October at a very prestigious panel event at Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester, which was chaired by the British historian, Professor David Olashoga. Um, and there were over 150 guests attending in person and hundreds watching via live stream. And the event is on YouTube, the full event, and I can send the link to you if you get in touch. And the next slide, please. Again, these are some great pictures of the panel event and the participants. And the panel event very much engaged the audience with new perspectives from young people. And I think, I think that this is really necessary for the policymakers and the heads of museums and academics and politicians and the general public who were part of the audience in, in the space and online to hear and engage with. Next slide. The event demonstrated how much we need to pass the power to speak about these issues to young people from diverse communities who have so much insight and guidance to offer when it comes to reshaping how history is told and commemorated in our public spaces, in spaces we call home and in spaces we feel we should belong to. And these are really important opportunities to reshape these relationships of power. And more of us need to make this effort to reconfigure who sits on these panels, who speaks, who makes decisions about what happens in public spaces. Next slide. So this is one of my favorite pictures from the pro project. It's a spontaneous selfie that captures the brilliant young participants in the project. Well, some of them, there was 20, and this is just a few of them all from diverse ethnic and racial backgrounds. And also we've got popular public intellectuals there, David Olashoga, the historian, and Gary Young, the journalist. And together, this group of people came together to challenge the racism that is all too familiar to us all when it comes to conversations about public heritage 
and its dark and violent connotations of empire and colonialism. And in the backdrop background there, you might make out um, activist Cleo Lake from Bristol, who's sharing a picture of George Floyd. Next slide, please. So the young participants really highlighted, like I said before, why these spaces were important for them, for their peers, but also significant for society that needs to reckon with its past. There's so much learning still to be done and an urgent need for museums and schools and colleges and universities to provide safe spaces for young people to share their stories about how their identities and belongings are impacted by their experience of what is revered in the public realm. And as Professor Gary Young, who you saw in the picture before, wrote in The Guardian, in Britain, we seem to have a very peculiar fixation with statues as we seek to petrify historical discourse, lather it in cement, hoist it high and insist on it as a permanent statement of fact, culture, truth and tradition that can never be questioned, touched, removed or recast. This statue obsession mistakes adulation for history, history for heritage and heritage for memory. And this was what we were trying to really challenge um, with this project. Next slide. So as one of the young participants, Hawa notes, in a country that has willful amnesia over the negative and violent histories of its past, Thinking critically about the meanings that statues hold, the histories they make visible and invisible, and the impact of their existence on communities and individuals is extremely necessary. The workshops created a space in which timely and important discussions could be held around mem memorialization, identity and belonging, and offered opportunity for creative reflection to express thoughts and opinions through poetry. And Rowan explains that attending the statues workshops was an opportunity to voice my opinions in an empowering space alongside with the young people, it allowed for us to think critically about the political, moral and historical implications of tainted commemorations. So next slide, please. So there were some really brilliant outcomes to the project where young people were being invited to other spaces to share the, their insights and advice on matters of public heritage. For example, very similar to um, Jennifer's, um, what Jennifer shared with us about Chicago and, uh, and what happened in Chicago. Um, the, last year, the mayor of London launched a commission for diversity in the public realm. And they invited um, myself to come along um, to an expert round table to explore um, what should happen to um, statues in the public realm. Um, and it, they brought together individuals who were engaged in practice, research, interventions, contesting heritage in the public realm. They agreed that two of my young people could come along and share their insights and experiences. You can see them there in the, in the middle um, image. Um, and the, the, the young people, Rowan and Samir, were really powerful and amazing. And this was recognized by all in attendance. They were so articulate in explaining why more young people from diverse backgrounds need to be part of these spaces where there are deputy mayors, commissioners, academics, artists, heritage organizations, community activists and others sharing and discussing what should happen with the public realm. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the, the project, my project, Whose Statues, Whose Stories, sits as part of a bigger sociological research project conducted with my colleagues at CODE. Um, and we've written a policy paper for the UK race equality think tank, Runnymede, um, about legislating statues in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement. Again, I can send you the link for this if you'd like, like the full document. But the main po points in the report are because the UK government is legislating anti-racist protests through a bill known as the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. This takes a punitive approach to young people who are contesting statues and it criminalizes their anti-racist protests. So we argue that although the government, we argue that though the government focuses on their need to protect history, 
um, statues are actually neither complete nor neutral records of history, rather they prioritize certain figures, stories and values while ignoring or erasing others. Um, on a positive note, we also talk about how local city councils, museums, academics, activists are exploring a wide range of processes to facilitate discussions about statues, to encourage learning about the histories of racism that they commemorate and consulting local residents on their views um, and to reach decisions about the future of some of these statues and how the public space can better represent diverse communities. Next slide. It's been really heartening to see some of our young participants have taken their learning and solidarity from the project and they've gone away and set up splinter activities to further raise awareness about their cities and the consequences of colonial legacies. Next slide. Here you can see some of the young people organized a Zoom workshop for other young people to come together and reflect upon statues and histories of Manchester with the aim of curating an online exhibition to showcase young people's stories and identities. Next slide. And at the Manchester Museum, we have our young cultural and learning participation officer, Hawa, who has been working with me to produce a zine uh, as a teaching resource for cultural institutions, schools and colleges to use to create spaces where other young people can similarly explore public heritage in critical and creative ways. Next slide. So some of our young participants have gone on to lead poetry workshops with the general public and to further build on their learning from the project. And next slide, final slide. Um, so how do we continue this work and how do we continue to disrupt the peculiar fixation that Gary that I mentioned earlier in Gary Young's quote with statues? How do we continue to question the mainstream versions of history that the young people learn in schools and that, that they're disillusioned with? Um, and these are really important questions that I don't have the answer to, but I'm sure we, uh, my point is we need to make more spaces to, to um, mull over how we can move on. Um, I'm, I hope we can build on the courage of the young cultural activists in the Colston moment and after. And I feel as a museum, um, it is our responsibility to provide opportunities for, for the younger generation to engage in individual and collective critical reflection about the way that institutions sometimes doggedly preserve their version of history and heritage and how this impacts upon their sense of belonging and identity to Britain. So please do follow us on our social media to see what might happen next in our journey um, as we try to reshape how and whose histories are told and commemorated in public space. We have a blog and we're on Instagram and Twitter. And just to end a big thank you to Marissa and the public humanities team for convening this really very necessary conference and elevating these topics in our public consciousness. Thank you. Well, I just want to um, start by thanking you all for such um, inspiring stories and such deep work. It's really a wonderful way to start the morning and to start this conference um, and such a gift to hear from all of you. I'm particularly grateful, uh, Sadia, for the photos of the young people. Their um, expressions of joy are a reminder um, to us all, maybe the, that there is a possibility for real joy and community. Um, and that reminder, I think, can often feel quite necessary. So thank you. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, that there are many uh, local and regional and I think international practitioners in our audience, um, artists and researchers. Um, and I hope that as we move into the dis this discussion, you will all um, feel welcomed to add to the discussion with your own questions and observations. Um, and as you are uh, doing that, I guess I wanted to, I was thinking about um, the way Marissa opened the session with a recognition that this lens is through some of the personal and, and communal um, reflections on this important work. And I wondered to start if you would each maybe talk a little bit about 
your own personal relationship to the work, how you came to it, um, and maybe some of the things either um, the impact on your uh, personal and, and communal lives, either good or uh, more challenging. I can start. <laughs> no one else will. Um, thank you, everyone. I, I, I guess I came through all this work through studying anthropology and history as a person of African descent, um, and you know, one of the most colonial disciplines. <laughs> Uh, they say in, in the academy where most of the people who are researching are white, Western, and most of the people researched are not. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think the discipline itself is a, a, a similar framework to um, the discipline of art and heritage making industries. And, you know, it's just, I, I, I can't think of a time that I was never, that I was ever not contemplating um, untold histories, because it's been obvious that we're not a part of the record for so long. So a lot of this for me is all about social justice and, and being part of the record. Um, so I teach courses on contested heritage and, and, um, and, and work a lot with museums but usually grassroots and social justice museums that are trying to change the paradigm. I think um, I'll go next. So really similar to Jennifer really and, and those same concerns and that kind of same positionality. Um, and also um, I'm working in Manchester Museum, which is a really progressive museum and creating these spaces for diverse young people to challenge um, mainstream narratives and histories. But I think what I do see is that that doesn't happen a lot in a lot of museum spaces. And even though we're doing it here at Manchester Museum and we've we've made a lot of progress, there's still such a, a long way to go. Um, and for me, I'm I'm a former uh, school teacher as well, so. For me, I feel like the, the way that the curriculum and what young people learn in schools impacts their identities and belongings as they go as they get older um, can be really detrimental and create all sorts of trauma for them. So it's for me, it's so important to have these spaces outside of formal education, perhaps in museums, in galleries where young people can come can have a voice, can belong and, and can feel welcome and can feel like it's their space where they can be really honest about some of the themes that, that have been raised today about racism, about whiteness, about privilege, about power. Um, and that's that for me is my kind of position on this. I actually have a deeper ancestral connection to these narratives. One of my uh, great great grandfathers uh, petitioned the Massachusetts Great and General Court back in the day in 1700s to remove uh, a dam uh, on our, one of our water in our community. And we've been continuing that kind of dialogue uh, through the generations. So it's multi generational where we've been uh, dealing to. Uh, De dealing with the colonialization of our landscape. And it's uh, every time I've testified in, in Massachusetts and in, in the, uh, at Beacon Hill, I was always reminded that I could be immediately uh, incarcerated, sold into slavery or hung because I was considered an enemy combatant. And those laws were still on the books in the 1990s when I testified. This led to other issues in Massachusetts area, like the, the great narratives that, uh, you know, not by the grace of God that everybody that came here was given all of our lands and our resources. And those narratives just show the colonial pattern that was going on for, for multi-generations. And we've been fighting it ever since. And <clears throat> in the uh, 1970s, when the federal government started to apply some more laws that were impacting us, we, uh, we had to come out of, out of that quietness and we had to actually engage the federal government more aggressively 
uh, to push back these and decolonize our history and decolonize all the things that they did against us. And they still do. And uh, we are still fighting that battle here in New Hampshire, which is, uh, as always said, there were no Indians ever here. Uh, there, this was a tourist state, first and foremost. And yet archaeology shows that we're here for almost 13,000 years. And they say, well, that's just fake science. Uh, you never were here. So we're dealing with some interesting intersections of uh, critical race theory. And uh, we're also dealing with, uh, you know, uh, culture cancellation, uh, but it's to the extreme. Uh, our state legislature has been working very aggressively against uh, uh, BIPOC people, uh, communities of color, and, uh, and it's gotten more aggressive in the most recent years. So with that being said, this is our only platform is to do speaking engagements yeah. like this. And continually educate. And sometimes um, we may set a path, but sometimes create and put you where you need to be. And so uh, I feel many of us uh, may have not initially started on what we say, but eventually uh, found our home and calling um, through the work that we do. And at the end of the day, I, I truly believe every single one of us is trying to create a more inclusive and a better future for all of our relations and our you know, ancestors to come. So uh, I, it just gives me hope to have events like this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go to the Q and A uh, because this question seems related on the level of personal, which is, um, from Katie Finn, this is uh, specifically for Jennifer, but I think probably applies to all of you. Um, how did you manage the direct feedback that you received, uh, things that might have been inflammatory or difficult? Um, how do you protect the committee and the people doing this work? And I would say, um, by extension, how do you think about your own uh, well-being when so much of the work that you're doing um, is makes us very vulnerable? Uh, to these situations and these histories? That's such a great question. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, you know, I was petrified of that. I, um, I was, of the three co-chairs, I was the only non-white co-chair. So I also knew that I occupied a different space, uh, you know, in many different ways to this whole process. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm not a big online presence. Um, so the trolling that happens online, I was guessing that that it would be akin to that and be really difficult to um, deal with. Um, but that said, I actually really, really, I don't want to say enjoyed, but because uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's a different... It, I, I read through all of the, you know, the thousands of direct feedback and, you know, there are people yelling, saying we're disgusting and, you know, for taking down these things. Um, and I found it really kind of not refreshing, but just okay that people were taking a space to express themselves. It wasn't nearly as bad as some of the things that I've seen online. Um, and then for the entire committee, we vetted everything first and we let them know, but they all wanted to, uh, I think for the most of us wanted to see it directly. So we actually asked if we want, if they wanted us to characterize it or make it available. And so we were, it was a very, you know, great process, but also a hard process because we were all figuring it out together and you just don't know your, the, the entire process is about these monuments and statues that cause harm. And then you don't want the process to also cause harm, to correct the harm. So uh, we were trying to be as sensitive, sensitive and thoughtful as possible and then do course correction. You know, it's, it's an ongoing learning um, thing. But I, I'm just, I just wonder if we didn't give people those engagements, then where is that conversation happening? So I actually really appreciated um, that people would tell us how they felt. It's very interesting, some of it. If you pull out the real, you know, the real substance underneath some of the language as well. Uh, Sadia or Denise and Paul, do you wanna? Talk yeah, about? you know, when we were faced with the uh, hand 
the Dustin Monument issue. It was right at the peak of the pandemic and pulling down all the Columbus monuments and all the Confederate monuments and all that stuff. We, we were faced with a, a, a dilemma, a real dilemma. Uh, Cotton Mather had ingrained uh, his culture throughout the period in New England so deeply that his narratives, in, in fact, his propaganda, I should say, was so instilled in everybody's thought process that when we started to tear apart the story, we, we found that, you know, Hannah Dustin actually killed six children. They never want to talk about that issue. And, but we said, you know, if we can't, if this is a big statue, this is not a simple, you know, it's 30 feet tall. It's 30, and it's granite. It's, it's going to have to be blown up. It's not going to be just taken down. So, you know, and we were pressured by other groups saying, you've got to take it down. You've got to take it down. But it was also protected by state statute law. So we were caught between a rock and a hard place. We want to re-envision it where we actually put a memorial to the indigenous people that were killed there. And this was a murder. This was not an act of war. This was a deliberate murder. And we'd like to narrate that and, and tell that story. But people don't like having those narrative changes, something that they're comfortable with because that's what they've been told their whole life. They don't want to think that their teachers lied to them or misled them in any way because these are people that they were taught to respect. Um, so people have a crisis of conscience. Um, so we let them vent, you know, write your hate mail. Um, I will read your hate mail. It doesn't necessarily change what we're doing because we're, comp we're developing an inclusive environment and your exclusive thought isn't gonna create the future that we all need to move forward you know, together. So if you need to vent, take that space and vent. But I, I also hope that you're thinking about what you're saying and what legacy that you wanna leave for the future generations. So for security, um, you know, how do we protect ourselves? You have to be in the right emotional and psychological state of mind to get involved in projects like this. You have skin, if you will. Um, you also protect yourself on a physical level. Um, my house is wired for sound, light, everything. You can't even step on my property without me knowing about it. So there are things that we've all had to do in order to protect ourselves, in order to create the environment that we need. But um, once again, Adeline, and your, your heart lies in these matters. And we believe that this is a, um, a long-term ancestral calling, and um, we're going to continue on the ways of our ancestors. Um, just to add to, um, I, I totally agree with everything that Jennifer, Denise and Paul just said. Um, and in our case, we had um, some online trolls on social media who tried to come up with some nonsense about why our project, uh, why the discussing, discussing statues wasn't important and so on. Um, and it was nasty. Um, and we just had to keep blocking them. Um, and the way I think for us, for me personally, and, I, and for other people too that I work with, I think one of the most important things is that they're, they're not perhaps the real danger. The real danger is that the people with power, the people who have the power to shut down these conversations in the media and politicians and so on. So for me, I think they're a bigger threat and a bigger worry than the nasty kind of very extreme right wing troll racist trolls that that come at you from hidden kind of um, avatars and no names anonymous people. Um, and I think, yeah, so for that, that's that's more of a conversation to be had about how do you respond to people in power who try and shut down these types of conversations and these spaces or to delegitimize them or you know to caricature these spaces um and that's a, a bigger question i think that that needs to be answered um and and generally as well it's about having a support network and allies and checking in with each other so sometimes in other pieces of work that i've done as well we've had um, people come after us and, and we get a lot of support from, from allies who will say, well, clearly you guys are doing the right thing. You're raising the right issues. And that's why they're coming after you to, to, to shut down those conversations. So it's really important to show 
um, you know, f to the people in the audience here today, if you see other people going through this, I think it's really important for you to show support to them. You might think it might not matter if you drop an email saying, I've seen this happening. I've seen you, you're, you're being shut down. I've seen that you're being trolled or, or so on. And I'm here to support you. And I think that's really important to show your allyship. Thank you. Thank you all. You know, um, Sadia, for making the distinction right between sort of trolls and the more kind of well-meaning um, or sincerely uh, willing to engage in some of these stories. I'm thinking just in all of your presentations, you all touched on how um, complicated some of these issues are and how uh, limited maybe the shared history or the shared narratives that um, communities may have are and so I guess I'm wondering if there are particular uh, strategies or approaches that have helped you. And again, talking uh, talking to people who are approaching this discussion in good faith, um, sort of address the complexity of these issues when sometimes what you're dealing with is just this monumental object, right? That is for one thing, it's simple you know it has a simple message so any thoughts you might have about how to make some of that complexity um, um i don't know something that people are able to approach in a meaningful way one of our well i agree with uh our previous conversation about it's our politicians we're most concerned about it's not so much our trolls our politicians constantly remind us that they killed us off and how could we still be here? Or well, we sold you into slavery in uh, 1626, I think it was. And they say, you couldn't be here. So we're dealing with that all the time, but we try to work within the system. We find that they make a lot of errors in legislation. They've been trying to legislate us out of existence. So we find as they try to proceed to eliminate us, whether it's in the educational system or mascots or, or place names, we, we find that we work, work the fringes of the political system and find those weaknesses. And, and when we had the critical race theory come up in our state and they did pass it with a budget as part of a budget amendment, we, we fought back and said, well, you can't keep on using mascots because you are actually elevating us to a point of a caricature. We're, we're now your logo. You can't have that, that's discrimination. Well, we thought we had them. This is really a civil rights issue now because now they've got this critical race theory in place and a lot of other sub legislation that prohibits what can be said in a school environment and we we said you know what this is a, an issue of litigation now because you can't have both standards you cannot degrade us and eliminate us from education and that's what they've been trying to do they decided they were not going to include any indigenous history in our state so we can push back and uh and we, we try to figure out where we can find their weaknesses. What we've had been able to do is stop really aggressive uh, legislation that are gonna be very detrimental. We've been able to stop. We can't seem to pass anything favorable, but we can stop the most egregious type of legislation that goes forward. So what we typically do is we'll reach out um, to the loud, louder voices that tend to be within the crowd and we'll sit down with them and have conversations one on one without the press without all the other you know noise that's in the background and and ha say what is your core issue what is you know the problem that you're pushing back on so much and typically by the end of the conversations we find out that we're actually on the same page just looking through all those different films that people look at life through and um, and those conversations just tend to move things forward in, in a more productive way. So we did that a lot in the mascot debates um, and we made a lot of progress uh, in, in that manner with individual schools. Um, and so we continue working on that grassroots process uh, to bring people um, together at the table. One of the most damning things we hear all the time is if you talk to an Indian, they're going to take your land back or have a casino and it's it, not true. It's not true. And <laughs> everybody knows that process is very difficult. Sadia or Jennifer, did you wanna um, speak to that at all? 
Sure. Um, I, um, I, one of the things that really helped us, in, so the, the advisory committee, I saw there was a question about the, our advisory committee and who made it up. And uh, our advisory committee was incredibly, incredibly diverse. So we had activists, we had elected officials, we had art, several artists, we had all sorts of um, different people, curators, we had historians, and not everybody agreed. So one of the things that was really helpful, we're really aware that the way we interact will reverberate to the whole project. So we jointly agreed to create guiding principles. And so even in those disagreements, we, we went back to those guiding principles that we all agreed on that would guide the process to remember what we were, what was at stake and what we were doing it for. It helped a lot. It also helped a lot to have um, such diverse group who really were um, dedicated and um, interested in the topic and wanted to hold the city accountable for, you know, in any way that they, whatever their per perspective was, um, you know, who really sort of represented various perspectives um, in the larger city. Um, so that, and I, I think that definitely showed up in some of the process that, um, you know, and it was part of me even getting involved. I had to be convinced that it wasn't going to be a gesture and that we could have independence in what we say and what we do um, in our recommendations for the city and for the mayor. Um, I won't say much on this because I feel like Jennifer, Denise and Paul have really covered it well. Um, but just to kind of reiterate the point I made in my presentation where I think it's really important to create spaces where you bring different people together. So um, academics, activists, um, policy makers, heads of museums, young people from diverse backgrounds. And it's really important that there's a diversity of, of background there. Um, and we need more of those spaces because at the moment it feels like people are just in their own silos, academics just talking to one another, young people talking to one another in their spaces, you know, so we need to create more spaces where people uh, who've got their own niches and their own expertise and experience come together and really kind of uh, ponder over and reflect over and, and, and over a, a period as well rather than rush because sometimes these spaces are created but they're very rushed and they're just a single session so I feel like there needs to be it needs to be sustained over a longer period of time because there are there are no easy ways to address these complexities um, as you all know. I, um, yeah, on that note, I realize that we are uh, at time and I think we could probably all um, talk all day and I hope, uh, I'm sorry that I didn't get to all the questions, but I hope um, you all will continue to engage in the uh, open sessions and throughout the day. Uh, I'm gonna thank you all again and turn it back to Marissa. Wow, thank you to our speakers for such um, dense presentations. It's like sometimes each slide had kind of represented years and years of work. Um, and so not just work and labor, but also I think what came through all of these presentations is um, the time, but the heart, the generosity. And, um, and I wanna thank Mary Kim for moderating the conversation whose own practice um, has all of these same qualities. So I think we're all really grateful to all four of you for starting us off this way. Um, one strand that ran through all the presentations, I think, was the necessity of designing and running deep community engagement processes as we struggle with these questions over what to do with the work we've inherited um, and the time, creativity, and sensitivity that that kind of work takes. So there was so much to learn from here. I just wanna thank you again for the work you do. And I wanna let people know who are here the presentations are all being recorded and will be posted on the Center for Public Humanities YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. So everyone who registered, you'll get an email when they're up with a link. Um, Hannah, do you mind putting up the Zoom link uh, for session two in the chat box for everyone, just to remind everyone? Um, we're going to be on the same Zoom link when we come back. Um, we're going to break for lunch until 1230 um, Eastern Standard Time. And, um, and then when we come back. Sorry, just to tell you what you have to look forward to. Um, session two is titled Managing Change at Sites of National Heritage. The speakers include 
the Reverend Canon Leonard Hamlin Sr., Washington National Cathedral. Um, he will speak about the process that resulted in the removal of several stained glass windows of Confederate officers in the cathedral and their plans for a new art commission to replace them. Alex Lamont Bishop, Deputy Secretary General of the International National Trust Organization in the UK. Um, he will share projects underway at four sites of enslavement across the globe that retell these histories. And Raul Ramos, Associate Professor at the University of Houston, who will be presenting on efforts to reinterpret the Alamo, what it means, and who it's for. So session two runs from 12.30 to 1.50 Eastern Standard Time. Um, and again, there will be time for audience questions. Um, same link as this morning. Hope to see you all then. Have a lovely lunch if that is your time zone. See you then. <laughs>